Buddhism is not just about knowing about Siddhartha, the founder. It is about the Dhamma, the Dharma he teaches. Pausing here. You've got two spellings of the same idea. Dhamma is Pali, which was the common spoken language of the time, not Sanskrit. The Dharma is the Sanskrit word, so obviously closely related. And I put a little question to provoke thought. What significance might there be in this teaching in Pali, in his teaching in Pali rather than Sanskrit? Think about the language used by the Brahmin priests, Sanskrit, the sacred language. He's t speaking in the ordinary language of ordinary people, not the elite priestly class. And that's significant. You know, he's offering his teachings and he's offering his teachings to anyone and everyone. He even <laughs> taught women, which was like unheard of. They are the lowest caste in a sense, low, regardless of their caste position, they are always the owned group at this time. So he's teaching to everyone. He's making his teaching accessible. And so it's important for us as our students of art history to understand what he's teaching because it's very much a system that's not about him as the deity, as he said, and I quoted earlier, you know, don't just rely on what I say, test it for yourself. So what you're supposed to test are the four noble truths, major teaching of Buddhism, the eightfold path, and the concept of the middle way. So there's lots of numbered lists in Buddhism. These are the primary ones. So what are the four noble truths? The first one is suffering. The fact that in this life, in this world, inevitably, everyone experiences suffering. To the causes and conditions of suffering. What causes suffering? How does it come into being? And then cessation. How do you stop suffering? How do you end suffering? We're in a world of pervasive suffering. How do we end that? What, and then the fourth is the, the experience of freedom from suffering. In Pali, this would be Nibbana. In Sanskrit, Nirvana. That is the definition of Nirvana or Nirvana, liberation from suffering. So the Pali word Dukkha means suffering. The opposite is Sukkha which is related to our word sh sucrose, sugar. Sweet and easy. Is life sukha? Is it sweet and easy? No. The textbook, like <laughs> Colbert, Stephen Colbert, I put this in as a joke. This is Stephen Colbert doing a comedy skit. And he's got a Subway sandwich with life is suffering. And then he's got it. He's jokingly becoming the Dalai Lama. So it's a little irreverent. But I point it out because, you know, the textbook translates it, life is suffering. That's not really correct. And I think it can be a little misleading. He's not, the, the Buddhist teaching is not that life is nothing but suffering. It's that suffering is an inescapable part of life. You know, and as 21st century Americans, we tend to think, oh, suffering means something horrible and extreme, right? Because in America, nobody suffers, right? Ha ha ha, that was a joke. Um, Suffering doesn't is a spectrum. It doesn't necessarily mean horrific extremes. Um, there's milder forms of suffering. If you look up the dictionary definition, it's difficult to bear. Anything that's difficult to bear could be, you know, you went hiking and your hiking boots have given you a blister and you have to hike back with that horrible blister. So we could translate that as, you know, dissatisfaction, dis disappointment, distress or, dis or stress, difficulty, all of this. So the Buddhist proposition is that there are causes and conditions of suffering. That, in other words, the suffering we have is rooted in our habitual minds of attachment and its flip side aversion, which can be also translated as desire, often is translated as desire or craving. And that these are rooted in our ignorance, our greed and hatred. Um, and our delusional mind, the fact that our minds are subject to illusions and delusions. So I put, this is another joking, <laughs> little joking slide. So this is a picture of my little, my pretty pony. Um, and I'm remembering by putting it in a time when my niece, who was at the time like six years old, 
we were shopping or something and she saw a little My Pretty Pony and she said, I have to have it. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic example of attachment. Um, and the attachment then causes its opposite aversion, you know, not, oh, that's a My Pretty Pony, but I have to have it. Like, I can't be happy without it. So, and so I'm putting here the question, is happiness getting what I want and get and not getting what I don't want? So Buddhism says that's what we conventionally assume and that's a trap. So Buddhism proposes that actually suffering can end. And that ending of suffering is the peacefulness of nirvana, the absolute peace of nirvana. And so this is a quote of one of the Buddha sutras, which are the actual um, kind of poetic utterances of the Buddha that were transmitted orally before being written down. So that's why the quote here is quoting the word of the words of the Buddha, live in serenity and joy. So this is the promise that there is a nirvana defined as serenity and joy. And you do that when the wise person delights in the truth and follows the law of the awakened. And there are these wonderful metaphors. The farmer channels water to his land, the fletcher whittles arrows, and the carpenter turns wood. So the wise direct their minds. So Buddhism is full of metaphors about cultivating the mind, right? Cultivation, like a farmer cultivating the soil to make things grow, of shaping the mind, right? Like turning the wood or whittling the arrows. And in Buddhism, the process of doing that involves the path to the liberation from suffering, the eightfold path. And this is represented in Buddhism as the wheel. Pay attention to this. This is the core symbol. I would, and I say it's analogous to the cross in Christianity because this core symbol gives us the wheel. We've already know that Buddhism is responding to the idea of samsara, the cycle of time and this kind of relentless cycle of becoming that produces suffering can be modified through these eight spokes. And so they are wise view or right view, wise intention, also sometimes translated as right intention or excuse me, right resolve, resolution, intention, and then right speech, action and livelihood, right effort, meditation and concentration. These are the actual pragmatic, practical points where a Buddhist practitioner engages with the path. In terms of the idea of the middle way, here is a very famous sutra where the Buddha is instructing his bhikkhu, his monk, his follower. And this person is named Sona. And Sona is a musician, which is great to have a name Sona sound <laughs> when you're a musician. And so the Buddha is, say, is explaining the middle way. And so this is a dialogue structure with the Buddha speaking formerly when you were a householder, which means when you lived in your house, in the life of the town, doing your regular things before you gave all that up as a renunciate. Were you skilled at playing the lute? You know, an instrument like a guitar. Yes, Lord. When the strings on the lute were too taut, was it tuneful and fit for playing? Certainly not, Lord. And when they were slack, was the lute tuneful and fit for playing? No, Lord. But when the strings were neither too taut nor too slack, but were keyed to an even pitch, was your lute tuneful and fit for playing? Yes, Lord. Even so, Sona, is the Dhamma I propose. So the Dhamma is the Dhamma of keying your mind, yourself, to an even pitch. No extremes of emotionality, of desire and hate, of craving and revulsion. Finding this even pitch that makes for an instrument, the mind as an instrument, that is tuneful. 